Welcome to the Hacking Music Podcast. Here you will learn the strategic frameworks, force multipliers, and micro habits that are essential for thriving in the new music marketplace. It will also help you to massively grow your artist career in new ways that support, strengthen, and sell your content. Here's your host, John Bashada. Now let's get started. Welcome, everybody, to the Hacking Music Podcast. Here we talk about the strategic frameworks, force multipliers, and micro habits essential for thriving in the new music marketplace. Hacking Music is the actual training practice we use and teach here at Jetpack Artist Ventures every day. It was developed over the last 15 years in management offices, recording studios, boardrooms, and performance arenas. Here, we don't want to be your guru. We don't want to spam your inbox. We don't want to be the loudest screaming voice at you on Facebook. What we do want to do is give you the execution and strategy tools you need to build a real real career and really create the next generation of great artists. So in this episode of the Mind Hive series, we're going to talk, we, we talk to those artists and producers who are thriving in the new music marketplace. Today we have with us a really special guest. His name is Eric Dahl. Eric Dahl is a publicity and content force of nature. I kind of think of him kind of like Forrest Gump. Everywhere Forrest Gump went, he created a new opportunity. Eric has some similar stories that we'll hear about where every chance or opportunity he has, he kind of turns it into a new opportunity. So I'm looking forward to this conversation with Eric to unpack some of how he thinks and to help you think better about your career. So real quick, some highlights from Eric's career so far. Eric has worked in television for 36 years, attended Belmont University. In 2009, he discovered and returned B.B. King's stolen Lucille guitar in a pawn shop in Las Vegas, which we'll have to hear about that. And some years later, he published a book with B.B. King's permission about Lucille. In 2012, he launched the Fox 17 Rock and Review interview series, interviewed everybody from Dolly Parton to CeeLo Green, Garth Brooks, George Clinton, everybody. Uh, He writes for music magazines. He's played guitar since he was five, rides motorcycles, and something I'm interested in, he's also a third generation vintner, which means he makes his own wine. So with that, let's welcome uh, my friend and our guest, Eric Dahl. John, thanks so much for having me on the show. I, I, I appreciate it, you know, and you and I just bumped into each other the other day, living so close together uh, over right. at Subways. And we've got yep. so much in common, you know, I always keep up with you and obviously I've interviewed some of your artists uh, right. through my shows. And, and also, you know, I've got a copy of your book. That's right, yeah. Which I still need signed. This one, yeah. Right, right there it is. Yeah, so, uh, good. So when you uh, offered me the chance to come on the show, um, I really appreciate it, because like I was Absolutely. telling you, as you know uh, from you and I chatting, um, you know, with what I do with my outlets through, through TV, through radio, through magazine articles and everything, um, my goal is always to help artists. You know, and yeah. and help you know the whatever genre of music they are uh, to help them get the word out on their new singles, their album, their book, their charity work, whatever they're doing. Yeah, and uh, I, I enjoy it. You know, it's one of yeah. those things. You know, and, and I appreciate working with you know people like you. Um, you know, that work so well with artists because, as you and I know, a, a lot of them after they create a great album or written great songs, they forget that they also need to have that PR. Yeah. arm to get the word out that's when the work starts yeah so to speak and, and yeah. it's necessary because you know as you and i both know john you can have the best you know music album single video whatever sure but if nobody knows about it you know people don't know where to find it if you can't get on yeah. the right playlist nobody's yeah. going to hear your song nobody's yeah. going to know you as an artist and and i think that's what it takes you know with pr firms and knowing the media outlets that fit Yep. You know, just like when you brought um, Jeff Coffee on. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so. it's a different world. And even now, kind of mid-pandemic or hopefully near end of pandemic. I hope so. The marketplace is continuing to shift. So right. 
you know, what we're talking about here, you know, is really important. Part of our mission at Jetpack is to multiply talent and to do that in a way that strengthens and supports artists. So that's hacking music is one of the ways in which we do that. So um, I'm excited for this conversation. So Eric, let's jump in. Kind of how, okay. how, how did you get here? How did you become you? You know, it's interesting, you know, uh, growing up, John, you know, my, my father was a musician. He was a bass player. And, and you know, here in my music room, I've got his bass over on the wall. Oh, nice. And so I was always around music and musicians. And, and at a very young age, um, you know, as you mentioned, I started playing guitar at five and, uh, and grew up around musicians. And so I, I played music and been around musicians all my life. And it's just a part of me. I, you know, my mom is a, a painting artist, you know, doesn't have the musical angle, but my father and obviously a lot of our relatives all the way back to Sweden were musicians. Mm. So it's kind of interesting, you know, how life takes you to where you need to be. And, and I was raised in Southeast Missouri, okay. played in a lot of local bands, you know, did a lot of uh, solo guitar work and all that. And, uh, and at first when I got out of high school, I came to Belmont because I was going to be a rock star. You know, I was coming out of a okay. small town, and I felt like I was pretty well known, you know, there and thought that I was pretty good. And you get to Belmont here in Nashville and go, wow, maybe I'm not that good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you yeah. Know, it's like you, you have that, uh, you know, uh, earth shaking moment. And I saw so many people going to Belmont at that time back in the 80s coming out with full music degrees and not being able to find jobs. And so that, you know, yeah. that kind of frightened me as a teenager at the time, John. Sure. So I ended up going back to uh, Southeast Missouri State back in Cape Toronto, Missouri. And got my degree in my backup plan, which was uh, obviously TV and radio. Okay. And I got a music minor in in music with uh, with jazz and classical guitar. Okay. So you know, nice. life takes you where it takes you. And I played right. in a lot of bands and all that good stuff. And uh, and from Missouri, I ended up working in Las Vegas for ten years. And I played the casinos there mm. and uh, opened for you know some pretty good sized bands and, and played a lot of casino gigs, which was right. a lot of fun, and it supported my guitar addiction. But then, sure. uh, you know, after 10 years there, the, the company moved me to Nashville. They offered me Nashville. And what happened there was that, you know, I had been on air years ago, you know, as an on-air talent for a little while uh, in Missouri, but you know, it was never my goal. I was like a behind-the-scenes guy. Right. Kind of like yourself with a lot of the stuff you do with artists. Sure. But, um, but when I got to Nashville, you know, I, I was looking at the market, you know, and, and I'm a big music gear guy and, and obviously watching all the artists and the music here in Nashville. And what, so year, what year was that, Eric? That was uh, 2011 when I first okay. came here. In 2011, I uh, moved back to Nashville and uh, with my family. And so uh, I approached the news department. I said, hey, got a great idea. I said, why don't you guys start doing these news segments and and talking about new music gear and all this stuff and so that's kind of and and they said wow that's a great idea why don't you do it mm -hmm. and uh it's like well that really wasn't the idea because i mean my real my day job at the tv stations you know for fox 17 cw 58 and my tv 30 i'm the creative services director and so i, I promote tv shows handle the programming live sports commercial production those yeah. that's my umbrella but um you know, sort of like the gauntlet was dropped, John. You know, when they said that, it's like, well, yeah. if you want to do it, you know, you have to do it. Sure. So at that point, I'm like going, okay, I'll launch this thing and maybe they'll take it. So I launched it in 2012 with the Fox 17 Rock Interview. And the early shows ended up being more gear heavy, kind of like what I do for magazine stuff. Yeah. And then one of the directors said, hey, this is fun. Why don't you bring on some of your buddies or some of the side people that play with the stars and have them on the show with you? And I'm like going, well, that sounds fun. I like hanging out with people, just like you and I hanging out and talking. <laughs> so I started bringing those people on the TV show. And then after that, the bigger artists got wind. They're like, wait a minute, you're my sideman guitarist and you're on a TV show. <laughs> hitting all these people, you know, you know, hitting 100,000 people with a show. I want to go on it. Sure. And so that's how it kept elevating, um, you know, through the yeah. years, starting in 2012. And then, you know, believe it or not, we're like over 500 episodes with the TV show yeah. now. Yeah. And, you know, after I, after you start getting some iconic uh, artists on the show, you know, like Dolly Parton, Kenny Rogers, Garth, Brad Pace, uh, and so on, then everybody wants on. You get, you know, you, when they yeah. see you have Paul Schaefer and CeeLo on, they're like going, yeah, I'd like to be on that TV show. But, sure. 
But I think yeah. also, you know, what I strive to do too, and, and what you know, um, with the TV show and even with the, with the YouTube interviews that are the extended interviews, is I try to keep it a conversation. Uh, yeah. I don't want okay. it to be your typical interview with an artist or a band. I want it to be an open conversation to where I learned something, the artist is comfortable, yeah. and the, the viewers that are engaging with us learn something. And so it's not you, just, so you, so you got a new album. <laughs> yeah. How do you keep the artist comfortable? What kind of psychology? How'd... You know, it's very interesting because, you know, I, I'm a people person, just as you are, John, and, and I love people, and I, and I especially have an affinity for musicians. Sure. Um, so usually what I, and, and that's what's been odd in this new pandemic world, as you and I were talking about, with all of us in quarantine and, and continuing to do TV and radio interviews, but from afar, right. is before, as you know, I would bring everybody into my office. Yeah. And and that was kind of like my green room to where it's like, hey, yeah. sit down. Here's some guitar picks. Let's, you know, you want a coffee, you want a bottle of water, and and not really just get comfortable with each right. other. And I think that's what makes the different interviews yeah. for me. And so now, even that I'm doing it remotely, just as you and I are right now, I still try and do the same. Before the interview starts, I usually log on ahead of time. And, and ask about their family and any new guitars and, mm -hmm. and what virtual shows they're doing. And, yeah. and also, you know, the difference for me from, I know a lot of interviews is I don't use a teleprompter. Right, right. So, so my approach is, you know, uh, working with the PR firms is I get a huge amount of information about the artist, the band. I actually listen to the new singles. I actually yeah. listen to the entire album and make notes. Right. And so I, I do all and that. That's, in preparation. And that's very rare. That it, I mean, you're a music person and you really connect with the artists on a musical level. Most people, most interviews are kind of, I don't want to say they're phoning it in, but it's like they don't listen to music. They don't get the backstory. You're, you're, right. you've got a special, you know, you really come at it from a music place, which is, I think, it really special and rare. Well, and I appreciate that because that's my goal. Because I mean, I, yeah. I, if if the artist or the band, John, is giving of their time to come and sit with me, whether it be in a virtual world or the or you know in a TV studio or in a radio studio, yeah, their time is valuable. I don't want to <laughs> waste it, and right. I want them to come away with going. That was one of the most fun and relaxed interviews yeah. I've ever had. Right. And then what you end up having is then you know they tell their friends it's like, hey. If you're in Nashville or if you're looking for a good TV or radio interview, make sure and get on one with Eric Dahl. Yeah. And so it's not your typical one. There's more depth. I, I like, I, I, to me, it's always fun. It's, uh, it's almost like investigative uh, stuff to where yeah. I like finding little nuggets. It's sure. like, you know, to where it's like, well, you know, you got your first guitar from here. And, you know, how is it playing in, you know, shows with your sister? You know, when you were little and they're like, oh, my gosh, you know, <laughs> because those aren't the usual questions they get. Yeah. They, you know, I think, uh, unfortunately, with some interviews that the people don't do enough prep, they don't listen to the music, which they all should. And and uh, I'll tell you what, you know, a quick story. I was uh, doing an interview uh, with a major country artist and uh, me and the guys were breaking down the camera and the lights and everything, John. And so we just finished. It was a great interview and, and the, just an amazing uh, interview that we had with the guy. And uh, so the next person's coming up, you know, and interviewing them for a magazine or radio show. And they didn't know what their last album was, didn't know what their new album was, yeah. didn't know any of the songs on it. And it's like, you know, and, and it, it, it was, I felt embarrassed for that person. Yeah. And, and, you know, and not that I ever would, and truthfully, you know, we, and we can get into my methodology, but, you know, having produced uh, live sports for a number of years, you mm -hmm. know, I, I do a full prep. So everything that the PR firm sends me, I print it out. I highlight it all. I handwrite notes just as you would if you're going to, um, yeah. you know, interview somebody for a sporting event. Right, right. And you I learned that from- You uh, make it yours. On air. You make Pardon it me? yours. You don't, yes, you I, don't yeah, I make it, I, I make it it's and, funny because a lot of, you, you know, people will say, Hey, you know, are you writing out questions? I'm like, no, I never write out questions. I, I write out interesting tidbits. You right. know what I mean? Because yeah. everybody, you know, to me, 
everybody's life is interesting, you know, more than mine. And so, you know, so I will dig in and I'll find these things going, you know, well, what happened with you that time, you know, that, uh, you know, you first played on the Opry, you know, or that you first met George Jones or something, you know, it's like going, and, and that opens it up, you know, as you know, from being in the office with me, like the green room, you know, I always joke artists and bands. It's like, I'm your opener. I'm right. your opener and closer. And so my, you know, they're not tuning in for Eric Dahl. They're tuning in yeah. to learn something new or, or if they're a fan of the artist, but, you know, also introduce me. To me, the biggest compliment I get from a viewer or listener is I listen to this new song or album from this artist or band because you introduced me to them. Yeah, that's a great compliment. Yeah. And, and I think that, that that's our job, you know, with, as being, you know, TV and radio and print outlets is to, to introduce people because that's, you know, as you and I both know, and you guys do a great job. And, and, you know, and I work a lot with PR firms, uh, with a lot of PR firms all over the world. But, you know, they have to approach you. And, and the PR firm's job is to get you interested. Right, right. As, as a media outlet yeah. to go, okay, even if they're not an A-list person, if you see a, an interesting nugget or, or you see them as an up-and-comer, or you listen to their music and go, oh, my gosh. You know, yeah. I didn't know this gal or this guy, but they sound so amazing. Right. I have to have them on a show. Yeah. And that's part of what I want to I want to pull out from you. Some of the crafting of the story in part two, where, where we'll go to a private hacking music group. But, oh. you know, a lot of it is, you know, too, John, and you guys, you know, send out so much, you know, with, with Jetpack and everything. But the first thing I will do you know, with, with any press release or anything I do, I get is I click on the music. Right. And, and it's like, and, and as you know, you know, it's just like with an interview or a resume, you've got so many seconds. That's right. You know, it's like somebody the other day was, uh, you know, and, 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 and I bless their hearts, you know, which is you and I know everybody says in the South, but, um, a lot of people will reach out to me through social media and send me music through all these different things. But, you know, it's usually best through a PR firm because usually I have a relationship with those people sure. and they know what I need and what I'm thinking. But, you know, I, I get 30 to 50 requests a day right. to come on either the TV or radio show. Yeah, that's a lot. And you sort of got to sort through those and look at, OK, well, what's compelling? What's, what's compelling? Yeah, yeah. You know, musically, yeah. you know, and to me, it's like, you know, um, it, it goes back to the old joke down to where it's like. What's your, what's your elevator spiel? Yep. Yeah. Give me your elevator spiel. You know, what is going to make somebody interested in you as an artist? Not because you got a new song, you got a new album, you know, you sound like Dolly Parton. What's interesting about you? What's different yeah. about you? Yep. Differentiation is. Bingo. Mm. And you know, it's just like what? what I try and do with the TV and radio show that, that I do. I don't want them to be like anybody else's TV or radio show. I want it right. to be different. So That's that when people go in, it's like, oh. You know, yeah. when Eric does this much different than Dan Rather, yeah. you know, or whomever. And, and to me, you know, I like people to be comfortable. I want it to, I want it to feel like a conversation, yeah. you know, as you know, when you were sitting in the studio, when we've done interviews to where it's like, it, 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 people open up yeah, and it's like, it, and I enjoy it, you know, and the artist enjoys it. And then obviously the viewers and the listeners enjoy it. And yeah. I think that's what you have to do. It is finding those different points right. instead of a sea of sameness. Yeah, 100%. So, Eric, you've introduced, interviewed hundred famous people every day, right? Strangest interview. Who, who, any, who did you interview that was, you know? It you was, know, it's like I, I've been very blessed, but also, you know, I'll be honest, John, I'm, I'm very picky, you know, right. on, on yeah. who I end up interviewing, and I haven't had – you know, a lot of strange ones. I, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've been very, uh, you know, blessed through the years to where, you know, there have not been a lot of odd ones. I've had a couple of them to where maybe you could tell some of the artists might've been hung over when they came in, mm -hmm. or maybe they came straight from playing Broadway the night before and didn't sleep before they came in. So yeah. those got a little bit interesting. You know, uh, one time I had an artist, it was so funny with, uh, with the PR firm, and they, uh, and they told me ahead of time, John, it's like, 
what you know, and I'm not going to name the artist, but they said, whatever you do, don't bring up uh, the artist issues with drug and alcohol. And I'm like, well, first off, I'm not that kind of interviewer and I wouldn't. And they're like, okay, well, we just like to, you know, say that. So the first thing is, I'm not kidding you. I sit down in the studio with the artist and, and they go, well, you know, Eric, now that I'm off the drugs and alcohol, my music's getting a lot better. And the uh -huh. whole time the PR person is over to my left and I'm like going, I am not looking over there. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, but yeah. you know what the artist says, what they say, they the say, does. you know, yeah. I, I'm fortunate, you know, I, I really haven't had, you know, any really weird interviews. Uh, Good. You know, Good. sometimes, sometimes they're in, you know, artists are people like all of us. And sometimes I think some of them can be tired or, or whatever. And, but I think usually too, and maybe it's just my methodology, I'm usually able to get them relaxed. Once I get right. them relaxed and we're talking, because I'll be honest with you, you know, and, and one, a major rock and roll artist I had early on, and um, he was camera shy. Hmm. Incredible artist, plays to sold out stadiums. But, you know, one has to no one. Problem stand, but, but you put him, you know, with lights and robotic cameras, as you've seen in our studio, and he was like freezing up on me oh. some. Yeah. And it's like going, Okay, come on, you know, and that's where it's like, I don't want to do all the talking. Yeah. You're the artist. You got a new album, a new single, a new tour, and, and you're a huge name in rock and roll. And I think that's the, that's the challenge. And I'll yeah. tell you what, and that's probably my fear, um, is to have an artist on that doesn't want to talk. And, you know, and I, and I got that right. guy to open up. But I've heard, like, other people, let's say, like, an Alan Jackson and stuff to where, there are some people that just don't like to be interviewed. Yeah. And, and I think that's where knock on wood, I've been very you know, fortunate to yeah. where if they don't want to be interviewed, I don't want to interview. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> if, if they don't want to come on a show and if they do not want to talk about, you know, their album or their guitars or bass or drums or whatever, you know, even talk about r working on their house when they're not on tour. Yeah. Um, I, I really don't want to have them on a show because I, if, if that somebody isn't going to enjoy doing the interview, then don't come on. I'll give you a funny one. Um, Colin Hay from Men at Work. Mm -hmm. uh, the last time I had him on, and just a great guy, monster talent. You know, what oh, a yeah. great solo career. And uh, you know, and one of his PR people reached out and said, "Well, hey, how did the interview go? You know, with Colin? Because I mean, some of the interviews haven't been going so great with people." I said, "It went amazing. Why didn't you tell me that ahead of time?" They're like, "Well, we didn't want to frighten you." <laughs> <laughs> but it ended up, you know, it, I think it's also John you know, in your business and my, my business is how we approach people. Right. And, you know, and I think once again, I think some interviewers and reporters and things in, in radio, TV, print, everything are trying to undermine some artists are trying to find, you know, they want to showcase the, the bad points that have happened in their life or the recent lawsuit mm -hmm. or running with the law or divorce or something like that. And, and to me, I find no joy in that. Yeah. And that's and, been covered. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean everybody and their brother is going to talk about that. Why would you want to be I, person 540? I think some, some interviewers do it as a way to try and stir them up so that they can get that, that crazy thing where they, you know, yeah. stand up and throw the mic down and all that. I don't want that. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, to me, you know, uh, I, it, I would enjoy it. Obviously the artist would never come back on any show I do again. And they'd also tell their friends, don't ever go on that show. And yeah. um, I just don't do it. So I've been fortunate to where even some of the artists that I've, I've told, you know, uh, people that I was going to go after, and they're like going, don't go for them, Eric. It won't be a good interview. And I'm like going, okay. And, yeah. and I sort of feel like, you know, if, it, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. Just like, you know, when you mentioned the Dolly interview. Sure. Uh, what happened on that one was the day before the opportunity happened, uh, the PR firm called up and said, hey, We've got 10 minutes, a 10 minute window in between international interviews with Dolly. Do you want it? It's like, yes, I do. And so took two camera people with me. I had uh, already listened to the whole album. I had an inch thick folder of all the information. I did all my prep the night before we wow. sat down. It was an amazing interview. And, uh, and fortunately, you know, Dolly was very complimentary. We got done with the interview. She tasked me on the arm and she goes, I just forgot how well you research before these things. I'm ah. like, the camera not rolling now, yeah. you know? And, and then I, and then I asked the PR right. person, I said, you know, can we get a, a quick picture with Dolly so that I can promote this interview? Because obviously 
that one aired, you know, nationally through our company. And uh, the PR team said, no, no, Eric, there's not time. And Dolly goes, oh, there's time for Eric. We'll take a picture. Ah, that's good. <laughs> and that's so good. it's like, you know, it's those kind of moments that I think yeah. make it worthwhile. And also be able to have some, some A-listers, you know, on the show too, that, yeah. you know, to me, I treat everybody like an A-lister, John. Yeah, you know, yeah. whether they're, you know, a, a debuting artist, an up-and-comer, somebody on the rise. You know, maybe they haven't had a hit or something out in a while, but they've got new music to count. Yeah. I mean, and, and so I try to, the, the preparation I do for interviews is the same with all of them. Yeah. I, I don't treat any of them lesser, and I maintain that file. Yeah, I get it. So, Eric, who, who has surprised you the most? Is anybody like specifically like not you know, what you expected? You know, so many people have, have surprised me, um, you know, because uh, especially once you, you sit down in studio, you know, it's one thing. And I think, you know, and obviously you and I both huge music fans and I listen to a huge amount of music and, and my daughter turns me on to new music and everything, you know, so she's a teenager, but you know, you'll have somebody come in, you know, and I would say, you know, I, a vast number of the artists I've had come in, um, will wow me, you know, because, uh, you know, I, I'll just learn something or they'll open up with something. I'm going, I didn't know that, you know, or else the PR people will be sitting off camera or off microphone at the radio studio and go, okay, I've never heard you tell that story before. You know, mm -hmm. that's like, um, Lee Greenwood, you know, learning about, you know, how his early days in music that I didn't know about, you know, mm -hmm. how, you know, how he struggled, you know, uh, coming up same yeah. thing with John Barry. Um, you know, uh, Stella Parton, uh, Dolly's sister, you yeah. know, how she struggled. Jeannie Seely on the Opry, you know, um, I was just talking about her the other day, John, to where, you know, she, you know, was so far ahead of her time to where, you know, she came on the Opry with a miniskirt. And everybody's like, hey, wait a minute now, Jeannie, yeah. you're kind of taking this too far. You're on the Opry. She's like, yeah, it's, it's the, I'm a woman and here's how I'm dressing. And Jeannie's still that way, you yeah. know, and, and so I think, you know, so many people, uh, Paul Schaefer, um, really, I, I gotta say, I really enjoyed that one. Uh, just knowing Paul from uh, being a Spinal Tap fan. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but obviously all of his band. Marty, work and everything. Marty Fufkin, Polymer Records. <laughs> yeah, and it was so funny. And you'll enjoy this one to where, you know, uh, and, and once again, I got to interview Paul because T.G. Shepard knew I wanted to interview him and they're friends. Oh. And so T.G. called me while I was uh, at the gym down from here in my house and I was on the elliptical and TG goes, Hey, I hear you want to interview Paul Schaefer. I'm like, well, it'd be great. He's like, well, Kelly's going to give you a number and you go ahead and call him. He's in town next week. So I ended up uh, interviewing Paul yeah. at the musicians hall of fame. That's great. And, uh, and so he, he walks up, John, he's walking up to me and I said, Hey, I was wondering if Artie Fuffkin was going to be here to help promote this album. And so then Paul falls right into mode. He goes, ah, Artie. Yeah. <laughs> and after that, the ice was broken. Yes. You know, that's and, fantastic. And, and all, you know, just a, a ridiculous musician, music conductor, does all of the music for the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame also. Yeah. But what I, what I learned in that interview was he told me, you know, I said, well, why weren't you in? the Blues Brothers movie. He said, I'll tell you honestly, uh, he had agreed to work on Gilda Radner's uh, new album at that okay. time. And, and obviously they were all friends, you know, all, you know, from Saturday Night Live stuff and all this. And so John Belushi told him if he didn't stop working on Gilda's album and focused on the Blues Brothers, he couldn't be in the movie. Ah. And that's why Paul Schaefer was not in the first Blues Brothers movie. What a band. But, yeah, Matt, oh my God. Matt Guitar Murphy. Steve you know, and Paul. all those guys are, you know, I mean, Matt passed away, but you know, like Steve Cropper, you know, lives here in town yeah. and, and Steve and Paul and all those guys are still friends. And so, you know, it's just like when I had uh, Steve Cropper on the TV show at a point and I had the, the Blues Brothers songbook that a, a buddy of mine had given me when I was a teenager. And I'm like going, hey, Steve, check this out. And I said, here's your picture from when you were in the movie. And Steve has gone, I've never seen that songbook in my life. I never even really? knew that. Wow. And so his PR people found a copy of that songbook in Australia and bought it for him. Wow, that's neat. Because he had never seen it. But, you know, that's, you know, having those kind of open dialogues, I, you yeah. know, 
in so many of the interviews, I end up discovering something. You know, if you ask the right questions and you listen uh, to, to what the uh, artists and the band are saying, you, you always come away with something. You come away with gold. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, and that's why I think that the artists enjoy it more because they get to, they get to actually speak and open up and yeah. tell you things about themselves that, you know, so many times I think that interviewers do have these set questions. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, it's like some of the YouTube things, John, where it's like going, okay, John, I'm going to have you on this YouTube thing and here are the set questions I have to ask you. Yeah. And I it's think like, most artists expect that kind of scripted awkwardness in interviews. Right. Unfortunately, I mean, that's kind of the, what happens, you know? Yeah. So. And, and to me, uh, and once again, uh, you know, and, and everybody has to do their own thing. And there's certainly, sure. you know, many interviewers and everything that have much more popular TV and radio and outlets than I have. Yep. I never want to be a part of anything that I would not want to watch or listen to myself. Yeah. And so that, you know, and so, you know, if, if I can't, you know, if I haven't listened to the album or the songs and I don't know anything about the artist, I haven't done any prep then I think that shows and I think that, you know, the artist is not comfortable then. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and when you're able, you know, to talk with somebody like a Paul Schaefer or, you know, Kenny Rogers. I mean, oh man, you talk about, you know, an artist and I was so fortunate to get to, you know, interview Kenny and I'm so sorry he passed recently, but he was so humble, you know, and you're talking with a guy. And, and once again, John, it's one of those things where you wish, the cameras or the the recorders were rolling before the interviews and after the interviews because you know like before the interview before Kenny came over to me to talk with me you know he's talking with his PR people and that was before he played Bridgestone you know his final the gambler tour wrapping it up and he's telling them I don't I don't think we're going to fill this venue I I don't see how this is going to work yeah. and he was that concerned about people coming to the Bridgestone obviously it's sold out yeah yeah, you know, but, but, but sure. you look at those artists, I mean, just like with Garth, you know, and uh, I, I credit Garth and Trisha to where, you know, when I got to interview them and, you know, I'll tell you how amazing it is. And I, and I think that's why I'm so drawn to music artists is to where Garth steps in front of our camera and there's all these cameras to interview all these people, right? Before his uh, 2017, uh, you know, multi-night uh concert there at Bridgestone here in Nashville mm -hmm. and my camera guy Nick is back behind the video camera and Garth reaches over the top of the camera and goes hey big guy I just want to say hi and Nick is prepping his camera I said Nick Garth is trying to shake your hand <laughs> <laughs> and so and but, great. I mean, how great was that and then Garth goes yeah Nick nice to meet you man thanks for coming yeah that's fantastic so Eric the world's changed, right? It, every six months, there's a new innovation, a new pivot, something that artists and producers and record labels have to think about differently, right? Right. So what, what have you seen that you're excited about? Could be, you know, I, I think, and, and, I, and once again, you have to find the positive in these situations because we all know the negatives. They're, they're blatantly obvious. With, uh, with the lack of touring, with how everything has changed, with uh, the quarantine, the pandemic, and everything else, what I've seen that inspires and, and, me. And I mean pre-pandemic, you know. <laughs> Forget well, the yeah, pandemic. And I'll tell you what, you know, and I'll, sort of, I'll go pre-pandemic and then I'll go into pandemic. Yes. The biggest change that I've seen in the last three years, John, you know, and, and this is, and a lot of artists come to me for advice too, and, and besides recommending a PR firm, which we'll get into later, you know, I, they, they're like, well, Eric, what do I need to do? And it's like, well, first off, you need to craft great songs or find great songs, you know. But, but what happened probably three or four years ago, John, that, that changed in my world as a receiver of, of music and artist PR and all that is that it used to be in the top of the PR thing. It's like, okay, this artist has had this many hit songs on Billboard, has toured with this many people, da-da-da-da, you know, that kind of analytic. Now, that stuff is on the bottom. Now what's on top is they have this many YouTube followers. They have this many Twitter, this much Instagram, you know, and so now the social media analytics became the currency. Right. 
and then over, and then over obviously the others. sales and billboard right numbers. yeah and then you know obviously you know where they rated on music row and all this stuff i me personally i still want all that sure but but i know to get on a lot of the shows now uh you know besides mine everybody's looking at what are your social media analytics you know what what kind of fan base do you have because the the media outlets feel that the social media numbers reflect that yeah it yeah. reflect your engagement you know yeah. so you know so and don't get me wrong it's like you know and i go down the same rabbit hole at a point to where somebody comes to me with a brand new artist and goes hey here's the here's the song you know so i'll, I'll take a listen to the song and then i go to their twitter and they've got 300 followers yeah, that's probably not ideal. Yeah, because uh, you know it. Because and I think that's something too, you know, that as artists and bands, and, and I know PR firms work with them on it. But you know, you, you have to have those analytics, and you have to have that engagement. Right. And so that was that's a huge change I saw within the last two to three years. To where yep. before that, social media, you know, as long as you did some Facebook, well, now you've got to be everywhere john you've got to be on on the twitter uh you know uh depending on your audience you need to be on TikTok. you know yeah. you've got to have be on facebook and you know and as, as i was leading into the pandemic and quarantine i think as well you know in in this day and age you need to be doing virtual you know uh tours you need to be playing from your house you need to you know it, it's not like the days that you and i grew up with to where you could go in and um you know, go to a fanfare, or CMA fest, and you can meet your favorite artist. You know, or you can go to a, a rock concert or some kind of podcast thing and and meet all the rock stars. It's like, well, now you have to do that virtually. Yeah. And so, and if you can reach, you know, um, you know, if you do a little, you know, like there's this one country artist now doing a daily show, mm -hmm. and she does this daily show from her barn. It's like, okay, how many thousand people are you reaching? Yeah. And I think that that's, and, and once again, you know, for music artists, unfortunately, you know, just, just having great music isn't enough. Yeah. And that's you know, one they, of the things that we think about, you know, we're, we're not a traditional record label or a traditional music publisher. We're a artist experience company. How, right. However artists are experienced, whether it's on silver discs, t-shirts, sync licenses, or live stream. It's like, that's, we want to be there to help the fans and followers experience them, whether it's exactly. on a t-shirt or a silver disc. Doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. So and I, and I think it's, it's finding, I, I think in this day and age, it's finding those opportunities now, because once again, and this is just me, I can only speak for myself, but um, a lot of PR firms and artists and bands are kind of surprised that I have no issue with bringing on indie artists or, yeah. you know, people that public, I have no challenges with that at all because I really don't look at that. Once yeah. again, it comes down to me, to the quality of the music and, you know, the, the artist or the band, and then do they have a following? The, the reality is, is that everybody's an independent artist, right? Whether you're with a major or a independent label, you know, mm -hmm. artists will do one-off deals with major labels. Uh, you know, just just a one-record deal. So they're oh, yeah. technically they're independent, and they're just mm -hmm. doing a co-venture for eighteen months, and then they'll flip, change it next year. So it's really the the major labels really have a hard time in moving fast and changing and breaking yep. things. You know, it's like they're not it, as nimble. But you know, you also yeah. you look at it too. John, you and I both know this. And once again, speaking, you know, to artists, you know, sometimes, you know, a cover of their favorite song on YouTube can do more for them in a viral situation right. than playing their own original. Yep. hundred percent. Yeah. You know, because if people start pushing it around and go, oh my gosh, you know, listen, listen to this rendition. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, and it, I think it works in a multi-level thing because also whether the artist is country rock, bluegrass, metal, whatever, to where maybe the, the one they're covering is not in their style of music. Yeah. And yeah. people go, oh, I didn't know they were influenced by James Taylor. Yeah. 
you know, or, or whomever. And I think that, but I, I think it has to be a more holistic version. I think the challenge for artists in this day and age is that having great music or great songs just isn't enough. Yeah. Yeah. And let's, let's flip over now, Eric. Let's flip over to the Hacking Music private group. Yeah. Conversation. So we'll cut here and we'll go into the private group. Okay. So this will pivot kind of more towards artists and some execution and strategy and process stuff that you. you yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Fire away. From. So let's talk about developing artists mm -hmm. uh, in the context of PR and media. Right. What are the common mistakes that you see happening at the lower level for, for developing artists? You know, I, I think for developing artists and, and it's, it's, and it's just been this way for so long to where I think a lot of them don't have a plan. And so, and, and don't give me, and we're, you know, just like you and I, we're passionate about what we do. We're, you know, certainly passionate about helping artists and everything like that. But I think, you know, it's one of those things too. It's, like, it's so funny, John. I think it was last night. <clears throat> my daughter showed me, you know, a, a clip from an old American Idol thing to where this gal was trying out. And, and, you know, she's front, in front of Simon and everybody, and she's going, but everybody loves me. All my friends love me. It's like, you know, and, and I think that happens with a lot of artists and bands to where, you know, whatever small town they come from, wherever in the country or wherever in the world, and everybody loves them there because yeah. nobody is going to say, well, you know, actually, Jimmy, you're singing a little flat on that one note. Mm -hmm. Nobody is going to be that honest with them. And then by the time they try to come, and make it big, they really need that honesty. You know, it, yeah. it's like, um, you know, it's just like we were talking before, you know, with, when I first came to Nashville <clears throat> and went to Belmont and I was humbled. And, and, you know, now did it stop me from making music? No. Am I still writing originals and still playing? Yes. But I, I think that, you know, it's sometimes an artist has to be humbled. Yeah. To get better. And, and also I think they need honest advice. Yep. And, and maybe, the, and that, and unfortunately, honest advice is usually not going to come from your friends or family. Yes. Because they want to see yeah. you make it. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's the thing too. It's like, you know, recordings don't lie, you know, and as you and I both know from being in the business and, and recording yourself and then letting other people really break it down, yeah. you know, and, and hearing those things. And I think that, it takes a, you really find out how thick your skin is. So it's that, and it's that, it's that don't, truth, you know. the truth tellers, the people that make the artist better instead yep. of just the fans that say, Oh, you're, 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 you're ready to headline. You're, you're right. ready to be a star today. The artists, those baby artists need to have kind of that mentoring and those truth tellers around them to raise their bar. I think they have to, because I think, you know, if you look at any major artist today, no matter the style of music, they had people like that yeah. in their lives. And, and, you know, and they started out and they thought, ah, you know, I've, I've got this, I'm really good. And then they're like going, no, you've got some of it. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, it's as you know, level. with, it's yeah, competing, it's a different level. And, at and, a different level. Yeah. and some people are willing to live at that level. If you, if you're willing, you know, uh, to live in your small area and be a huge demand and stay there. Okay. Yep. But if, but if you want to go to the next level, then you really, it, it's not, it's not the same litmus test. Yep. And so I think that a lot of artists, you know, if you know, it's like what I try to do even with my interviews and shows too, John, to where it's like, you know, not that I am ever going to be to the level of, a Larry King, uh, a, you know, a Howard Stern, Ryan Seacrest, you know, some of these great interviews and stuff, Dan Rather. But I look to them and I look at what they're doing and how they're doing it. And I try and up my game, yeah. you know, because that's because I don't look locally and go, hey, how are they doing it here in Nashville? Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. I, I'm looking at the people that are the AA list. And I think yep. the same thing with artists and bands. Yep. That's don't. don't Measure yourself to the market you're in. Measure yourself to the market you want to be in. Yeah. We call that patterning mm -hmm. in the hacking music method. It's like, who are you patterning after? You know, those kind of things. Really 
that's how you get better. You compete at a higher level. And especially with songs, it's like, right. you know, your songs, again, hometown hero, you, you can write anything and it'll probably be pretty good enough, good enough for the yeah. hometown hero. But when you're talking about a radio campaign and a publicity campaign, you know, that song has to compete at a very high level for yep. the, end, the end listener. So, so right. that concept around that song, production, all of it, it's just a very different level you're competing at. It really is. And another point too, John, that you bring up very well, that I think a lot of artists, you know, once again, you know, they're, they're so consumed by the music and performing and the songwriting and, and maybe even the stage presence. And one of the things that's forgotten that I found with a lot of, um, you know, up and coming artists and bands is they did not practice going through interviews. Mm, interesting. And, you know, and so, which makes it hard for an interviewer, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, because, you know, I, and you know, cause you've been around me and we're friends, but it's like, you know, I'm not a hard interviewer. You know, when, right, I, when right. I'm interviewing people, I throw them softballs. Yeah. But the thing is, you're going to run into interviewers via radio, and you're on a radio tour, TV tour, you know, you're on Good Morning America, they may not throw you softballs. Yeah, they may not care. They, they may not, may not they <laughs> may, you know, it's like college professors, you know, it's, it's like one thing when you're in high school and junior high, and you know, and the, and the professors really want you and I to pass, and they're trying to do everything, you get to yeah. college, they don't care, well, it's the same thing, right. you know, you go on these major outlets, you know, you're sitting down with Dan Rather. You better know how to speak eloquently. Yeah, and stay on message. And stay on message, get your point. And I think that, you know, in, in my opinion, and my suggestion yeah. is that with up and coming artists and bands, truthfully, you should probably practice this mm -hmm. and maybe even record it yes. to where, you know, um, let's say, you know, a local radio friend, you know, or somebody, you know, whoever interviews you. And you record that and then you know how to answer because that's the hardest thing is that me as an interviewer, I know where I'm leading people, right. you know, you know, just like, you know, you and I did, you know, with this conversation as to where, you know, I will open up, I will tell you about them, you know, we'll go into the music, we'll go into the album, the book, the tour, the charity, all this kind of stuff. And then I'm going to wrap it up at the end. And when I wrap it up at the end, you have to be on point enough to go, Here's my website. Here's my social media. I'm going to be on tour next month. Catch me on Jimmy Kimmel. Right. Right. Because, so, and that's what, and that's, and that falls upon the artist yeah. and, and the band to do, to do that because the PR firm is achieving the interview for them. Right. You know, it's like, it's like somebody, you know, taking you to the basketball court. It's like, okay, here's the basketball. You have to sink it in. The hoop. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Next question, Eric. So two things that I observe about you is that you have a lot of output. You're able to get stuff into the world, whether it's books, interviews, whatever. Your, your output is, is significant. Thank you. And the second part of that is process. What are your processes like that drive your output? I'd love to hear your personal, you know, how, how you, what are your processes and right. how do you think about output? You know, it, it's an interesting uh, thing to bring up and thank you for, for saying that because uh, I'm, I'm driven, um, you know, with all of my outlets, with my TV, with my radio print books. And so for me, you know, I kind of learned this from my dad when I was young to where he was a maker of list mm. and, and, you know, you know how that with, with your parents and everything, those things wear off on you. And so I keep running lists on virtually everything I do. And so with my TV show, you know, I will have a list of, you know, who's upcoming and I'm starting to prep that file and I'm starting to prepare to listen to that music. Yeah. Same thing with my radio show, you know, that's already booked out two months in advance and yeah. I prep a folder for each one. So the, so the process is I'm always looking forward and I'm never looking back. Um, and could be a flaw. Maybe I need to look back more, but I'm not that, it's just not, not the way I'm built. Sure, and sure. so to me, it's, I'm always in a state of preparation okay. uh, for the next interview. Uh, you know, like I've got, you know, Jimmy Webb coming up soon. Mm -hmm. I've got Tiffany 
uh, you know, the 80s star coming on for a TV interview. I've got Samantha Fish coming on for a radio show and Emerson Hart from Tonic coming yeah. on for a radio show. So I'm constantly looking ahead and thinking ahead and I'm very goal driven and I'm very um, deadline driven. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I always know um, before any TV or a radio interview, the night before I do my final prep. Yeah. And so, and then, and so I think you have to have those processes and uh, exercises that you know make you, you know, work yeah. best. And so the night before any interview, I do the full folder prep. The morning of, I will review it again. And I will usually listen to the music again. And, and before quarantine, when I would be uh, driving to the TV station, I would listen to the artist's music. Mm -hmm. And then when I would be driving to iHeart Studios, I would be listening to the artist's music. Yeah. And so to me, it, it just, you know, I want to be ingrained in that artist or band. And, and just like I'm writing a book, you know, like we talked about, you know, with, with your book and my book to where, you know, I'm doing an update on my B.B. King book. So I've been very focused on that with the new chapters and then, you know, getting the pictures in. And so I want to get that completed, you know, because the first printing was back in 2013. Right. The reason I want to get the, the new one updated and out, John, is because I've got three other books I want to work on. Right. And, and I've already got the ideas for those books worked on. I've got two other radio shows and podcasts in the wings and probably another video show mm -hmm. that's in discussions and, and a nationally syndicated TV show is talking to me about doing interviews for them this fall. Right. But so your processes, your, your tasks, your lists, your goals, yeah. those things are really essential to what you get in the world. Without, totally. those, without those things, you're just a schizophrenic, crazy totally. man. Well, because, you know, and much like yourself, too, you know, you and I both work with very skeleton, you know, a very light staff. And, and so a lot of it falls on me, um, including, you know, when I have an artist on a TV or radio show to where, you know, I have my process to where it's like, OK, I notify the PR firm that this artist is going to be on the TV show tomorrow. I send it to news to let them know, here's the artist, here's the episode number. And then I promote it on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Right. And then the artist can push it out too. And then after it airs, you know, just like, uh, you know, the latest TV interview I did with Sammy Kershaw, then after everything is aired in multiple markets, then I release it, as you know, through my outlets. And so it, it's all process and yeah. methodical, but it's also looking forward. And, and I think the other thing, you know, that obviously you and I both share is to where I always want to be better. Yeah. I, and I think that, you know, and I, and I think that's where sometimes artists and bands, you know, aren't always looking at being better and they need to, because I mean, for me, you know, it's like, okay, well I had on Dolly Parton. That's cool. Uh, you know, who's on my wish list? Lady Gaga. Mm -hmm. I have not had Lady Gaga on a show yet. And so, you know, and so I'm always striving, you know, I'm, I'm like we talked about with Dan rather and other interviewers, I'm always striving to be better yeah. and get these people and sometimes it's not the AA list or maybe it's you know a B lister or somebody else or or somebody that you know hasn't done music in 10 or 15 years but is coming back now sure. or an up and comer with an interesting story you know it, to me it's just um it, it, it's staying in the keeping it passionate yeah and uh and and once again you know and, and, and certainly no knock on anybody but if the music isn't good yeah I can't have them on a show because, you know, because to me, you know, with the people that know me, my, my friends and, and everybody else and people that look to me, they, they want to hear good music, no matter what genre. Yeah. yeah. And so, I, you know, if, it's, if, the, if the music isn't great, if, if you know, if, they, if they're singing and it's flat, if, you know, if, if, whatever, it's like going, okay, well, I, somebody else can have you. Yeah. And do better. Yep. Do better. And I think all of us, I think, you know, I, and right. what I expect myself. And I think that artists, you know, you have to have those methodical processes yep. to get things achieved. Because, you know, if you don't have the goals and you don't have the ambition, then they're just dreams. Yeah. And, and I'm not knocking dreams because yeah. we all have our dreams, yeah. but you got sure to have steps to get there. 
right. the, the you, sequence of smaller goals that get you there. I think, you know, I call them, a, once again, it's a, such a funny story, John. You appreciate this story. Only in Las Vegas. When I was living in Vegas, I, I was invited to this uh, fancy restaurant grand opening. And so, and I can't remember the name of the restaurant now. It was in one of the casinos, I think the MGM. And so I met this clown, Clown Harpo. And he's like the clown to the presidents and all that stuff. And he's got a, you know, and at the time, I was working on my BB King book and he was working on his book of his whole career, you know, being President Ford's clown and all this kind of stuff all over the world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so he asked me, he said, well, Eric, how do you make progress on your book with everything you've got going on? I said, well, I treat it like a whopper. What I do is I try to take one bite out of it a day. Mm -hmm. And before I know it, I'm done with the whopper. Yeah. You know, and, right. and, and he, he eventually, you know, his book just went to publish this year in 2020. Yep. So, and mine published in 2013. So it took him yes. seven more years to complete the Whopper, but he yes. got it finished. But I mean, I think that, you know, you, you have to set reasonable goals, you know, some achievable goals and then some lofty goals. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I certainly, you know, with my list of interview people for radio, TV, magazine, everything, I've got achievable ones and I have, you know, ones in the wings, but also I've got, you know, I'd like to interview Willie Nelson. I haven't interviewed him yet. Sure. Yeah. And I think that for artists, the same thing, you know, just as you said with the patterning, you know, you don't have to mirror them. You don't have to be like them, but we all have to be better. Right. You know, because if we just remain the same, you know, I don't, I don't want to be the same interviewer, or same person I was, you know, when I started doing the TV or when I started doing the radio shows yep. or my writing, you know, even now it's so funny, John, I know you can relate to this with the, with the BB King book updates. And I look at some of the stuff that, you know, with the original book, I'm like, Oh, I could have written that so much better. But you know, the difference is 2013 when the book came out, you know, I did it because it was a passion project. Right. And, and, you know, and I, I'd written articles and stuff in college and blah, 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 and all that stuff. But since 2013, to now, I've had 10,000 published articles right. in, you know, in a bunch of magazines, and I've honed my writing craft. Yeah. Yeah. And so now, the way I'm writing my chapters now is much better than it was back then, but it's that learning process. You know, yeah. you can't knock it, you know. Uh, fortunately, I was able to get a book out and published, and it's, yep. it's sold out now. But, uh, but you get better, hopefully. Right. Each, each cycle, you get better. Exactly. So Eric, and we, and we could talk about project management. We'll, we'll come back another time and talk about that. Okay. But as for you, technology, software, what is essential for you as, as your workflow? What do you really depend on? You know, uh, it's, once again, this has really changed with the pandemic and quarantine sure. to where, you know, things that, you know, before, obviously, you know, and, and, you know, for you and I, I embrace, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I haven't hopped on TikTok yet. I probably need to and I will. But, you know, you, you have to be a communicator. Okay. And, and I think that's where a lot of artists and bands get lost because, and, and maybe they're not good at it. Maybe they don't want to do it. Maybe they need to hire somebody to do it, you know, to where, you know, because some people just don't, you know, they're not wanting to be in the social media realm right but here's the thing your fans and your listeners are right and and your fans and listeners that are looking you know for a new song or to put in their playlist you know on spotify or whatever they're looking for social media so you know the the big things for me that have changed you know coming into the the time we are right now obviously i'm using a lot of zoom i'm using skype um, you know, for, for my TV interviews and everything like that, mm -hmm. we're still, you know, still doing distribution pretty much the same way. Um, although I'll tell you something I'm eyeing, and I think a lot of your music artists should eye as well, uh, particularly the Instagram videos. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, since uh, Facebook, you know, took them over, I think that's another opportunity. I think I, the Facebook. IG TV. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great opportunity for artists. And I'm probably going to delve into that more for my radio shows. Now I'm using Zencaster, um, which uh, my director at uh, iHeart found that for me to where we're able to send it 
to music artists wherever they are in the country, and they log in, I log in, and it's like we're in studio. Zencaster. Mm -hmm. It's a Z E N C A S T R, and uh, and I, I'll tell you what, I really recommend the format just because okay. then what happens is you know if you and I were doing a radio interview, it it records each of our uh, almost like a separate track, like multi-track okay. recording, those okay. separate tracks, and then you know my producer downloads them and then he inserts the songs in them for the show to air. Oh, nice. Nice. And so it really keeps up the quality because I think that's the hardest thing yeah. in, in the time we are right now is trying to keep up the video and audio quality, yeah. you know, because some people in, don't get me wrong, you know, particularly, you know, a lot of generation Z, they're willing to accept, you know, uh, lesser video, lesser audio. To me, I, I still want at yeah. least as high quality as I can, just like you and I were talking, you know, the way I set up for uh, doing these TV interviews and this is the same way I have it. I set up my wall, you know, think about your surroundings. Yeah. Think about your lighting. I'm using diffused lighting. I've set these things up. I want better audio. I've got a Rode microphone. So to me, you know, it, it's like, you know, and I'll tell you what, I gained a lot of this. I was at a, uh, an interview for uh, John Carter Cash, Johnny Cash's son. Yep. And one of my buddies, TJ, came in with a rig like this, you know, and, and everybody else, all the other you know, TV outlets have the giant cameras and all this stuff. And, uh, and my buddy TJ just comes in with this little setup, you know, with his phone and everything. I'm like, what is that? He goes, man, this is my rig. He's yeah. like, you might, uh, you know, position this. And so he, you know, he positions it. He walks up there with John Carter Cash, does his interview for his show and goes, there we go. I said, I'm building one of those. Yeah, yeah. And so what I did was I took his concept and, and kind of, you know, expanded it out for me. So, you know, what I'm doing this interview with you on, um, I built it so that if I'm doing stuff for the United Kingdom as well, because sometimes I do interviews there, that I can take this, I can use a, uh, a shutter button, I can set up the camera, set up the light, it's all in one piece, I can hit start and do my interview and stop it hmm. with Bluetooth. Nice, nice. And the thing is, you know, and I think the greatest tool that any of us have right now, John, is is the smartphone. Because, and, and if artists aren't use, utilizing it, they really need to, you know, hop off the text and hop off the games and look at what your, you know, smartphone will do because right. you've got great audio, you've got, you know, great video, full HD video, whatever level you right. want. You know, I read an article um, on Kanye the, the other day and it was talking about, you know, his last hit song most of the audio bytes he had recorded into notes in his uh, phone. That, you know, to me, you, you have to be open to new technology yeah. and using it to your benefit and to get your word out and to get your music out and to engage the audience and creating a great album or a great song or a great video isn't enough. Right. right. You know, you gotta, well, what do you, you think, know, you gotta, what do you think you is too to much? What do you think is I'm too sorry. much? What do you think is too much? You hear of Gary Vee and Grant Cardone talking about creating 30 pieces of content a day. For, for the artist, you know, what, what is that appropriate engagement level that is really, really builds an organic relationship with, with their followers? Right. What, what you know, you, I, I, think, I think that's, you know, that's overwhelming. And, and I get what they're saying, but pieces of content, all content is not created equally. And so, you know, we have the thing that I certainly call rich content, which is what you're probably going to put on your Facebook, your web, you know, but each, each level of social media needs to be treated as a different outlet. Okay. So, you know, what you, you don't want to post and don't get me wrong, it's easy and some people do it, but you don't want to hop into Hootsuite and put your same video across all the platforms. It needs to be different, you know, whereas what you put on Instagram needs to be different, maybe more picture driven, maybe a little more intimate. Maybe what you put on Twitter is different because they're all different audiences. Right. And so 30 pieces of content, I mean, I think that's overwhelming. Um, I, I, I think you have to, I, I'm a believer in the Bill Murray method, baby steps. Mm -hmm. um, first off, you know, and, and here's the a thing too, you know, and I keep, I always have this conversation. 
and this is one of my personal flaws with me, is embracing myself as a brand. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, of, if, if, you, if you come on my TV, radio, print, anything I do, what is brand Eric Dahl? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest things, you know, to me, any artist or band needs to do, you know, either by themselves or with a PR firm is sit down and go, what is my brand? Right. What does my brand bring? You know, and also, like we said earlier, what does my brand bring that's different? Right. And I think once you determine that, because, you know, because I'm going through the same process and I had a hard time grappling with that because yeah. to me, well, you, you don't I'm get it right. Outlet. You don't get it right the first time. No. You get it no. kind of there. But yeah. then four months from now when you do it, it's a little a little more defined, a little more differentiated. Yeah. It's like each cycle gets and better. I think, I think you're totally right, John. I think also, you know, having friends and having, you know, PR people and artists and everything that are honest with you helps you shape and, and define that brand. Right. Because, you know, when I did it, you know, a few years ago, I finally buckled down and I did, you know, Eric Dahl publicity so that I could have my TV, my, my multiple radio, multiple magazine book, all this stuff under one umbrella. And I kind of had to come to terms with it. And I think that with artists, the same thing to where, you know, before you can really launch out, you know, it, it's got to be continuity. But before you can launch out your web, your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram, your TikTok, you know, your, your T-shirts and all this kind of stuff. What is your brand? Who are you? Yeah. What makes you different? You know, and, and I think defining that and then also, you know, as we were talking about content. Sometimes content, just like we're doing, you know, you and I are doing right now, can just be you playing in your house. You know, can be you playing a song. That can be content for web or YouTube. And then maybe for Instagram, it's a picture of you restringing your guitar. Right. And so I think, and also the biggest thing to me, which also I had to embrace a few years ago, is uh, professional photo shoots. I know your Aunt Betty thinks she's a photographer. She can do great at the uh, family reunions and around right. the house, but you know, pay a couple hundred dollars, whatever, and have somebody shoot professional photos that reinforce your brand. Yeah. How did you, how did you begin to find your brand? You know, it's, uh, a, a lot of it, well, like I said, it's, it's, it's a struggle. It's still a struggle it for me. It is. It's like, um, a, it's like an awkward thing to do. You know you have to do it. You don't yeah. want to do it, but it's essential, right? I mean, you know, it, came down to, it came down to where other people, artists and, and people around me, you know, started saying, well, here's what your brand is. Yeah. And, and, but, you know, as you know, John, from being involved in this so long as well, at a point, you have to take what they say, and then you have to define it yourself. Otherwise, people will define it for you. Right, which is what Jeff Bezos says. Yep. He, says he says, your brand is what people tell you when you're, when you're out of the room. It's like they right. tell you what, what they think. Right, because, you know, and, that's in a, in the, and the turning point for me, and sometimes you don't realize the turning points. You know, obviously, when I discovered, you know, B.B. King's Lucille and returned it back in 2009, that 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 took me to another level that I didn't know because I was just doing the right thing and yeah. you know returning Mr. King's guitar. But then also, I wanted to do a book just because I was passionate, wanted to do a book. I didn't you know it was no for no other reason, and I didn't realize how much that would define me because that gave me street cred. And then it's kind of you know amongst musicians, particularly guitarists. It's like a mythological story. And so everybody knows the B.B. King stolen Lucille story. They just may not know it's me. Right. But right. if they know it's me, people like to tell the story or when I'm in the room go, hey, Eric, tell that B.B. King story. Yeah. And so that you have defining moments in your life. You know, I'll, I'll give you, for instance, to where, you know, if an artist, you know, as, as a young person met George Jones and, you know, or, or met Porter Wagner or something. Well, that's a defining moment, and that can be brought up into their future right. because did that partially define their brand. Right. 
And I think for me, so, definitely discovering the Lucille, writing the book, and then launching into the media outlets that I have. So it's kind of project. Changed. But like you said, too, it's all morphed also. You look at what the TV show was originally. It was pretty much gear driven. And now it's become totally artist driven. Right, right. So it's kind of project driven, like, like hindsight 2020, you can kind of see, okay, yeah, project one, project two, three, four. Right. Your, your projects kind of define you in a sense is what you're definitely. saying. Definitely. I think okay. uh, definitely the, for me, the projects define me because, you know, what I do on radio and TV are very similar, but the writing kind of still goes back to my original to yeah. where the, the magazine and everything is certainly more music gear reviews. Same thing even book-wise, you know, with the B.B. King book. It's much more of a reference book. Sure, it's got the story about the discovery of Lucille. But, um, but yeah, you know, I, I think they each have to be their own box. Yeah, that makes sense. But, but the brand, you know, but also, you know, you are ultimately the brand. Yeah. And whenever, you know, a lot of people know me as the B.B. King guy. And then other people just know me as the TV and radio guy. Mm -hmm. So people know, people know a dimension of you, but does it all feed the same brand? Right, right. And I think that artists and bands have to ask that, what, what is your, you know, it can't just be, well, you know, I'm a country singer, I'm a rock singer. It's like, eh, yeah, okay. You and 5,000 other people. Right. And, I, yeah. and as you and I both know, I think, you know, it, and especially, you know, which I love the Americana umbrella, but even to define yourself within that. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, well, what makes you unique, unique to Americana? Yeah. You know, where do you stand out? Who have you toured with? Who have you played with? Who's on your album? Mm -hmm. Who have you co-written with? Right. You know, I think there's so many elements that define us, and it, it's hard. It's, it's um, you know, it, it's humbling, you know, because yeah, yeah. you really have to <clears throat> look at yourself, look at what you're generating and creating, and go, this is me. Yeah. And being maybe it's not the me that I want to be. You know, I can, I can say that with me to where, you know, with, with my content and everything, it's like, I love it, John, don't get me wrong with the TV, radio, everything I'm doing, but I want to be bigger and better five years from now. Right. Right. Yeah. I may never be Dan rather or Howard Stern, but I don't want to be the same Eric doll five years from now that I am today. Right. hundred percent. So Eric, for somebody, who may be patterning after you. Somebody says, I want to, I want to do what Eric's doing. I may be 21 years old. Right. What do you tell that guy? You know, I, I'll tell you what I, you know, if they are looking to do this, <clears throat> I wish I had started earlier uh, because once again, life kind of happens to you. Like we were talking with the Lucille and, and music and all that stuff. If I had things to start again, I, I would have started doing these interviews in my twenties. Um, because the thing is, you know, the biggest thing, like I told you too, John, I think even before we started the, the interview to where find a void and fill it. Okay. So just when you start. look around, you know, and, and just like you've done with, with your company as well, and you look around and go, okay, well, here's all the people doing all these things. They're kind of like what I want to do, but there's a hole. Right. I want to fill that hole. And, th and that's what I did for me, you know, and, and so if, if they're passionate and they want to pattern, you know, after me with their TV interviews, with the radio interviews, the great thing is now with the, the uh, smartphones and the technology, you can do it all from home. Yeah. I mean, you look at these YouTubers that are just doing amazing things. And, and, and as you, you're going to continue to have new social media products launching all the time, every year, just like TikTok has and everything else. Right. To where, you know, TikTok started out to where it was used on Instagram and that's become its own thing. And you're going to keep having this evolution. But if you know what you want to do, if you know whether with your interviews, you know, who you want to interview, maybe you only want to interview one style of music. Maybe you only want to do underground music. You know, I mean, I, I think chase what you're passionate about. Right. Because that's what I've done. Uh, you know, because I'm passionate about all styles of music and all musical artists. Chase that, but also don't wait. And yeah. I think that applies certainly to musical artists as well. You know, you've got a cell phone, you've got a computer, Get you going. know, uh, lights are cheap. 
you know, setting up one of these rigs like I did, you know, I, I did it all for like a hundred dollars yeah. with an Ulanzi holder, a roadie microphone and a sun pack, you know, LED. And I got a light kit for like $125. There you go. Yep. You know, granted when I go into the TV studio, it's like, sure, you know, it's a, uh, I'm in a $2 million studio with robotic cameras. Well, right now in quarantine, I'm not, I'm, yep. I'm doing it on a, a cell phone, you know, by iPhone. And it's like, you know, start doing things. You know, if, if you're wanting to pattern off what I'm doing, start shooting and cutting audio and doing video now and putting it out, but also review what you're doing and let, and, and, and how can I put this best? When people give you honest advice, um, take it in a positive manner and not as a critique. Right, right. Let them make because, you I mean, because Yeah, because it, it makes you better. As long as they mean it in the right way, sure. you know, um, you know I, I think that we, you know, that's the only way you get better. But yeah, somebody coming out right now, you've got technology, you know, in your back pocket yeah. that you and I never had. I mean, before, you know, you and I would have had to go out and it's like, well, we got to have a, you know, $10,000 video camera. And, and a light kit's a minimum $500. Now you order it all from Amazon, it's shipped to your front door and like going, okay, tonight on my YouTube show. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's the thing that's opened the door for me on it too, John, is with, with my radio and TV interviews even to where, you know, like talking about Sammy Kershaw interview. He was at his home in Louisiana doing this with me. Yeah. It's Whereas before I had to wait till somebody came in studio came in Nashville, you know, or else they lived with in the market and like a, a Clint Black or whatever, or CeeLo Green, we'd, we'd go to them. Now, you right. know, it's, it's, uh, it takes down those barriers. Yeah. We just, talking about how connected the world is, we just signed a new artist. Um, you may have heard of Leonid and Friends, the Russian yeah. band. Uh -huh. uh, so their lead singer, we just recently signed to Jetpack Label Group, and he's, you know, he's from the Ukraine. Right. So we are, we are in full production mode, four songs into his record. Never met. I mean, we, we talk, right. you know, every week, a couple of times, but it's like, it's, it's moving. The train is moving. Yeah. The fans are connecting and the record's coming together and we're building a really neat platform underneath him so it's but you know but you could not have done that without the current technology we yeah. have you yeah. know that's like a, i had a, a band on a month or so ago called the sweet lizzie project and it ends up that uh raul malo from the mavericks discovered them when he was in cuba hmm. and then he brought them here to the u.s and they're an amazing rock band wow yeah and you know it's like once again funny stuff that happens to you and i I was, uh, I was at a funeral a couple months ago, and I was telling um, my uh, mother-in-law's brother, I said, yeah, I said, I'm doing a lot of interviews for the UK. He goes, University of Kentucky? <laughs> I said, no, United Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, oh, but mm. you know, but we can do that now. Yeah. You know, to where, you know, I, I shoot these interviews, you know, with Webb Wilder or with, uh, you know, uh, Christy and Walter Carter you know, at Carter Vintage Guitars, yeah, yeah. and it's airing in England. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, Eric, so. this was great, man. Thanks so much for joining us as a guest. Um, how can people get in touch with you? Do you want people to get in touch with you? I guess. Yes, I question. definitely do. And, and happy to, uh, to uh, you know, give advice and help where I, where I can as well, John. Yeah. Or yeah. probably the easiest way is just to go to, uh, you know, ericdahlpublicity.com. And, and uh, you can send me an email through there. Right, right. Uh, it's so funny because somebody tagged me on the line with Rolled Doll the other day. And it's like, are you any relation to Rolled? I'm like, no, I wish I was. <laughs> He's a famous author. I have one book. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but, you know, right. but everybody, you know, you can reach out to me through there. You know, if you've got uh, questions, you know, concerning, you know, what you and I talked about. But, um, you know, I think now, you know, even though there are not, you know, the, the, the great publishing companies and a lot of the stuff, you know, that we knew over the years, it's still a great time to be alive. It's a great time to make music, but it's, it's taking these technological tools and outlets and using them in a fashion to get the reach out. Wouldn't you agree? hundred percent. Yeah. It's, it's, 
it's the best time to be making music if you're smart about it. Bingo. Bingo. Cool. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. So yeah, if, uh, if any of the listeners for the podcast, you know, anybody wants to reach out, please feel free to, I'm happy to uh, give advice and help where I can. And, uh, you know, so thrilled that you guys are doing what you do and, and with your book and, uh, everything you've got going on. It, it's fun. Nashville is such a great market to be in. And, you know, it, it's a, just a creative hub. It really and is. So people that don't live here. Yeah. To where, you know, people come through or they come to a song ride or they come to do interviews. And it's, and I think that we feed off each other. Yeah. And I think, you know, just like with you and I, I think it makes us all better. Yeah. It really and is that, music city in the truest sense of the world. Right. You know, it's not just country and Christian. Now it's, Metal, yeah. instrumental, uh, it's yeah. fantastic. Eric, thank yeah. you so much for joining us. Thank My you pleasure. Much. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot, John. Appreciate you. The Hacking Music Podcast is brought to you by Jetpack Artist Ventures. Create what's next.